Hey friends, and welcome to the Happy Hour with Jamie Ivy podcast. I'm your host, Jamie, and I'm here every week, and I am super excited that you are here with me today as well. Every week on this show, I invite a girlfriend to join me, and we chat about the big things in life, the little things in life, and everything in between. Today, my guest is Katherine Wolf. but before I tell you about her, I want to let you know that at the very end of the show, I'm going to be talking about all the Happy Hour events that are popping up lately and how you can make sure that you know about them. But first, I want to thank one of our sponsors for the show. Uh, One of our sponsors is the Restore Women's Conference. And guys, how many of you just need a weekend away to be a little refreshed? I know I need that sometimes. And the Restore Women's Conference is the place for you to do that. They're encouraging you to invite your girlfriends, your sisters, or your mom and join them in a time of fellowship, learning, and laughter. Or you know what? Just come on your own and connect with other like-minded women who are seeking to renew their joy in the Lord. The conference is happening next March, March 3rd through 5th in sunny Orange County, California. Restore is a weekend conference designed for women to experience God's grace and rest in an authentic and uplifting environment. Conference admission includes an unforgettable speaker lineup with Allison Allen, Allie Worthington, and me. I'll be there, guys. Um, Also, worship and Bible journaling and holy yoga, three meals, swag bag, and access to our handmade market and mocktail social event. Guys, make sure to get your ticket before they're all gone. You can go to RestoreWomen'sConference.com and use the promotional code HAPPYHOUR to receive 50 bucks off your admission. Yay, and if you don't remember that link, I'll have it on my webpage. The promotional code is good until the event sells out, so use it as you can. However, the early bird pricing ends September 1st. For daily devotions and more information, follow at Restore Women's Conference on Instagram and Facebook. Okay, guys, I told you my guest is Catherine Wolf, and I met Catherine at the IF Gathering this past year where I was super honored to interview her for some of the If Gathering videos. Her story is one that is full of suffering and pain, but it is not at all remotely defined by that. Catherine has embraced her suffering and she loves to share with others how her suffering has actually brought her closer to God. Goodness gracious, guys, get ready for an amazing chat today with my guest, Catherine. Guys, before we hear from Catherine, I wanna tell you two things. Number one, if you never wanna miss an episode of The Happy Hour, make sure that you subscribe. For all of you iTunes users, go to jamieivy.com slash iTunes. And if you're an Android user, just use whatever podcasting app that you're used to and search Happy Hour with Jamie Ivy. That way, every single week when there's a new show, you don't have to search for it, but it comes straight to your listening device. Okay, guys, so much information. I know. Stick with me. Last thing before we start. You guys know that I was just in Ethiopia. If you listen to episode number 96 which if you haven't, go back and listen to it. But if you listen to it, you heard me chatting with my friends Jen Hatmaker and Rachel Hollis about our upcoming trip. Well, we've already gone, and we had such an amazing time. Uh, Seriously, so amazing. I really encourage you to go read Jen's blog and and see the videos that Rachel's putting up. And our other guy that was with us, J.D. Scott, find him on Facebook. And I wrote a blog about it. It was so wonderful to see the work that Help One Now is doing inside that country. The entire program is run by Ethiopians, and the program that we were specifically visiting is called the Family Empowerment Program. Guys, they are taking vulnerable women, they're training them, they're giving them resources, they're helping them find a trade and a skill that they're already good at. And then guys, these women go off and they start their own businesses. They are business owners, and I loved it so much, I was so impressed. We met women running hair salons, neighborhood stores, restaurants. A one woman makes injera, which if you know anything about Ethiopia, it's like their main course. I ate so much of it. And then she's selling it wholesale. I was blown away by these women and their strength. Okay, now here's where I want to ask you to join us. Listen up. I'm almost done. I promise this is a lot of information. Because we're wanting to help 300 more women to go through this program. 300. That's not that many. Thousands of you listen to the show every single week. So I'm wondering if us happy hour listeners can help. I wonder if you'd like to help us. It costs $1,000 to send one woman through this program. And then, guys, she is set up for success. No more handouts. No more giving her something that only lasts a few months. And, guys, not only has her life changed, but her entire family has changed. Her children's lives are changed. And we all know that this change is going to just become a ripple effect into their community. So, guys, I'm going to ask you to help me. I'm going to make it really easy. Go to jamieivy.com. You can remember that. jamieivy.com slash Ethiopia check out the Help One Now site and see what you can give. When I say that every dollar matters, I truly, truly mean that. So guys, if you're listening and you only have 10 extra dollars this month, then you give $10 and you hold your head up high. But friends, if you're listening and you can give $100, then you do that and you hold your head up high. 
And maybe if you're listening and you've got an extra $5,000 that you just came upon and you would love to support these women, that would send five women through the program, then you do that. Guys, I want to see how the Happy Hour listeners can really support these ladies. We want to bless their socks off. We want to give our resources to help one now so that then they can turn around and transfer that to the leadership in Ethiopia. Okay, that's the most talking I've ever done before a guest. If this is your first time, this is not normal. If you listen forever, you know my heart that I just want you to know about this ministry and this organization and a follow-up from episode 96 if you listen. Okay, finally and for real, here is my conversation with Katherine Wolf. Hey, Catherine, welcome to the happy hour. I'm so glad hey, you're here. I'm so glad to be here. Well, who thanks for having me. I am so lovely. Okay, so I met you. I just want to recap. I yeah. met you at the If Gathering, which I feel like I say that a lot with guests on my show. Like, oh, I met you at the If Gathering. But I met you at a dinner probably the night before it started. Is that true? We were... Yeah, exactly. Really delicious Mexican food, I think. And yeah, that was so fun. Yes, it was great. And so I met you and... In you came in your wheelchair, and I knew that at the table there were a handful of people I hadn't met, and you were one of them. Um, yeah. And I was completely intrigued, and my friend Amy sat by. My friend Amy got to sit by you that night, and it was from there that I got to hear a little bit of your story. And then the following day, I actually did an interview with you uh, right. for the If yeah. Gathering, which was even better. And so then I read your book this summer, and here we are. Here we are. We're here. Well, well, yeah, I'm, I'm memorable from the If Gathering because I was the young blonde in the wheelchair, so I kind of stuck out. Uh -huh. and it's kind of how I identify myself. Oh, I was the blonde girl in the wheelchair, and everybody's like, oh, yeah. I remember you. Now, I didn't see this, but you actually did something on stage, didn't you? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. It, um, it was really powerful because they paired me with this other wonderful girl, Larissa Murphy, mm -hmm. whose husband had a severe brain injury, and we shared our stories of suffering, um, in short, celebrating just how we have both managed to cope with extreme young suffering in our early life, mm -hmm. and really how we've turned to Jesus to cope with the realities of, you know, I mean, everything, unmet expectations, um, just what, how suffering young can deeply inform your life mm -hmm. and how you can really choose to live within the walls of suffering and survive there and, in fact, celebrate and love your life from that place. And it was, it was really fabulous. Um, for me. That's uh, so amazing. Amazing. I, I wish I could have seen it. I knew that you got you two were going to do that. And Larissa is someone I've been trying. We've been back and forth about getting her on the show. And I read her and Ian's book, I guess maybe three years ago when it came out. Um, yeah. 828. I think that's what it's called. Yeah. I, I, I read it too. It is 828. Um, in part because of Romans 828, uh -huh. that he did all things for good. Also, um, that's the birth <laughs> birthday of Ian's father. Anyway, awesome book, and their story is incredible. Incredible. I've been trying to get, <clears throat> sorry, I've been trying to get her on the podcast as well for a while. So Wonderful. I, I want to, I mean, don't you have a kind of a phrase that you use in your book for people who are young that go through suffering? Well, m many fabulous words, basically goddesses, divas, incredible <laughs> people, unite, um, rock stars is probably a... But don't you say general, like, don't you call but, it like but, a club? But, but what you're talking about is I have a very elite club that you have strict um, classification, what's the word, like you have strict... Qualifications, yeah. Yeah, qualifications to get into, and it's called the Young Suffering Club. Mm -hmm. Um. I recently trademarked it. I'm just kidding. <laughs> um, but the Young Suffering Club is for people who've just been to hell and back, honestly, when they're young, and recognize that this can be a beautiful informant for the rest of their lives. And really, um, they get to live special lives of celebrating what it means to legitimately have some significant trauma at a young age. In fact, I really can rant, which I'm sure you can't imagine, <laughs> about um, the notion of post-traumatic growth and how 
opposite of what the world and our culture tells us is that post-traumatic stress is the only response to suffering and absolutely post-traumatic stress is a hundred percent real oh my goodness but there's also this beautiful phenomenon that research is showing where people can not only bounce back and be resilient, but can actually grow because of trauma mm. at a young age, in my opinion. I love that. And I want to give everybody who doesn't know your story a little bit of background about your Young Suffering Club that you started and are the president of. Um, and so your story is just moving. And I feel like I, one thing I love that I know that the listeners are going to get over this next hour from you is is the way that you view suffering is actually very biblical. I mean, when you get down to it, it is very biblical and you've had to walk through that and that hasn't been easy. Can you take us back, you know, however many years ago when that's the day that your suffering started in 2008? Absolutely. Everything was perfectly normal. I was totally healthy. Didn't even have a general doctor. Nothing. Had just had a baby naturally six months before. Life was easy, awesome, and we were loving having this crazy adventure on the beach in Malibu because my husband was in law school at Pepperdine, and um, things were great. And Suddenly, I had a massive brainstem stroke out of the clear blue, no warning, no signs, nothing, and um, hit the ground and only woke up two months later to a whole new reality of a severely disabled body and tremendous health, horrible health problems. And after 11 surgeries and a severely broken leg and literally going through the fire, I have come out the other end and can really celebrate um, where God has brought me. And yeah, I, we wrote a book last year, which was so cool, but way cooler than that was that I had a baby last year, mm -hmm. and um, you can imagine most people who are on Medicare in wheelchairs and have major legit health problems don't have children again, and I did, Yeah, <laughs> we are loving life with a crazy active one-year-old that is legitimately rocking my world in the very best way, and so... That's kind of our story in super um, Reader's Digest Clift Note version. For I sure, for say. sure. Well, one thing I remember reading, and your book is called Hope Heals, and I highly recommend it if y'all can get your hands on it, and I'll put the link to it up in the show notes. But I was reading, um, and I, I wasn't aware of this. There were, I wasn't aware of a few things. Number one, I wasn't aware of those two months that you don't remember anything from. But I also wasn't aware that you were at home when this happened, with your right. son, and your husband just happened to come home that day. Exactly. It's truly miraculous. Excuse me. Truly miraculous. Jay just happened, in quotes, mm -hmm. I said just happened. Right. It's a God thing. Totally, totally. Truly a miracle. He just happened to come home between classes to work on a paper for his final law school class and was able to call 911, and my six-month-old baby slept through the entire thing. He was taking a nap in the next room and didn't even know the ambulance came, the paramedics rushed in, locked me into the stretcher. None of it. He slept through the whole thing. It was hilarious. <laughs> yeah, I'm glad that he did. And yeah, I'm, hilarious. I'm, kind of. Right. Kind of hilarious. <laughs> right. And, you know, so you, you go to the hospital, they rush you down there, and you're also just, in quotes, happen to be, you know, closest to one of the best hospitals in the country. Um, and, exactly. And you totally. immediately go into surgery, and um, you don't really remember anything for those first two months. And that was, were you in ICU for those first two months? Right. So, no. So, when I had the stroke, which was like a really severe brain aneurysm would rupture. Mine was way worse than that. It's called an AVM, but nobody's ever heard of it. And what it is, is like a terrible um, abnormality, malformation of blood vessels that rupture and basically create this heinous explosion in your brain. And when that happened, I had to be rushed into micro brain surgery. So 16 hours later, um, my sweet neurosurgeon um, 
came out and told Jay and my family that I had lived, but that there would be deficits. Mm. And um, I essentially went into ICU from there for 40 days, which we feel like is very biblically significant mm -hmm. that it was 40 days, not 39, mm -hmm. not 41, 40 days literally wandering out in that crazy wilderness and then I would sort of go to the promised land but not really <laughs> yet actually it was still kind of a, a weird hell in the hallway kind of thing for another couple of years but mm. I um I have no memory at all from hitting the ground at Pepperdine University to waking up in a different part of the hospital, acute rehab, over two months later. So mm. it's like I go down and then take a two-month nap yeah. and wake up, and I had been exclusively breastfeeding my sweet baby mm. who was six months old when I had the, a brain rupture, and it took me a while to even wrap my mind around the fact I wasn't feeding him anymore. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's really tragic. When I first woke up, I, um, gosh, I get choked up talking about it. I thought I could feed him. Mm -hmm. I just thought, you know, we need to have the men leave the room and mm -hmm. I'd move the hospital gown over mm -hmm. and he'd get in the hospital bed and I'd feed him. I couldn't even understand that. I didn't do that anymore mm -hmm. and that other people had been caring for my baby for months. I just, I had no context, category, understanding that I wasn't really being mommy anymore. Mm -hmm. And it was very painful. But see, Jamie, the goodness of God in the land of the living is that now I'm writing a new story. I should say God is writing a new story with my life and that I have a new baby. Mm -hmm. and. He's way older than six months old, and I'm there. I'm engaging him, and in a way, the years the locusts have eaten have been redeemed, mm. and it's bittersweet. I mean, as I hold my one-year-old, I I almost cry sometimes thinking, you know, I, I didn't do that. I you missed that, yeah. yeah. Yeah, I missed it, and that's painful, mm -hmm. but I think... God really calls us to remember differently than the world, in fact, remembers, and to not um, long for the past or be constrained by the past, but really to, to redefine how we understand what happened mm. and really learn the right lessons from what happened. And the truth is, even though it's complicated for sure, I do have James as an eight-year-old, and mm -hmm. I do have John as a one-year-old, and it's complicated, but they're yeah. here, and I'm here, and hallelujah, yeah. you know, it's kind of crazy fabulous, actually. I remember I read in your book when, I guess, you had woken up, and the family had come in, and the, and the doctors were actually kind of just telling you, telling you and your family everything that had gone on, and, you know, they it was Dr. Gonzalez. He's telling you all this stuff. And, and, you know, and you said, so I should have died. And he, he, what he said back to you, I thought was so good. He said, no, if you should have, then you would have. Absolutely. I, thought, I, I love that. I love that so much. What a beautiful thought that no, you were not supposed to die because right. you would be dead, <laughs> but you are here for a reason. And mm -hmm. I think that may have been one of the very first moments where I felt special. Mm -hmm. I felt like, oh my word, like God has spared my life for a reason. Now I will live into the special assignment he's given me. And clearly this is a unique calling. It's Ephesians 4.1. It's a calling that's special and I need to now live a life worthy of it. Mm -hmm. And yeah. the truth is, we're all here, no matter our age. And I could rant and rant about aging and how it's actually a beautiful thing because aging means you lived, you made us. <laughs> right, right. And I love that because we are here on assignment for a reason. And Dr. Gonzalez spoke that beautiful truth mm. to me early on that yeah. if I was supposed to die, I would have. And I didn't. So now get busy living. That's and right relearn to walk and eat and swallow and speak and get on with life. And by the way, 
he didn't say this, but I heard this. Tell the world about what's happened here. This is crazy cool. You gotta, you gotta give a shout out to the one who did all this, which is Jesus Christ. I love it so much. Now, when I, I want to ask you this: When you woke up after those two months, um, yeah. Do you remember the moment? I mean, my my question is: You had to have been so confused. Waking oh, up, realizing yeah, yeah. the last memory was I'm in my house doing whatever you were doing, and now I'm in this hospital bed, and I'm sure that there were wires. You couldn't, could you, I don't know if you could speak then yet. Uh, you no, couldn't no, swallow. But, yeah, um, no, yeah. What was it like when you woke up? Do you remember feeling confused, thinking, what the heck, where am I, who are these people? What was that like when you first woke up? Yeah, it was bizarre, and thankfully... My brain was still fairly foggy, so I I wasn't fully aware enough to be freaked out. I was more in this bizarre delirium for many weeks of just not even processing, like, okay, this is kind of cool. My family's all here, and all my friends are here, and I'm, I'm in this bizarre, like, visiting type situation and everybody's flown in from all over the country mm -hmm. <laughs> and I don't think it, it really fully could grip me yet and then down the road it was a realization of oh I can't eat food and oh I can't walk anymore and oh I can't speak and slowly but surely there were layers of horror and complication but it was definitely a long process mm -hmm. and I think um, early on someone spoke the beautiful truth of John sixteen thirty three that there is trouble there's knock your socks off trouble in this broken messed up world and horrible things do happen but the truth is that he has overcome the world mm -hmm. so I can relearn to walk and eat and get out of bed because I'm not on my own here. God is at work. Mm -hmm. And I could, in fact, celebrate in this heinous tribulation because God's power was and is bigger than these horrible, horrible tragedies. And he's with me in them. So I could celebrate his power mm -hmm. and his presence in my nightmare and legitimately that was a comfort. That wasn't like a weird cold comfort or seemed attached. That was like, I've got nothing to hold on to, but I know deep in my soul that the truths of Jesus now matter mm. so much. Um, at the if gathering, I know you didn't hear this session, but I broke out all of a sudden after they told my story into the following quote. This is not a drill, people. And uh, did you catch that? Yes. On the drill? Because that beautiful truth of now every single dadgum truth you've ever heard in your entire life really matters mm. because you need it so badly. All of the like sweet, like Caucasian affluent girl from the South who, you know, heard some truth when she was in VBS when she was eight years old, that she's got the joy, joy, joy down in her heart. Well, now this is when the pedal meets the metal. It's mm. time for her to call on some of that joy she's got deep down in her heart. And thankfully, that is exactly what happened. I was able to call on that. It did work. Isn't that so cool, Jamie? It's amazing. I remember at one point in the book, you talk about how you had been doing a Bible study before your stroke. And um, I think you were studying Esther. Is that right? Oh, yeah. Yeah. No, yeah. After, after the stroke. Yes. Oh, okay. Okay. So before, you were doing a Bible study before, and you were encouraging the girls to hide God's word in their heart. And I remember you talked about in the book, and I have said this to people in the last couple of months after I read your book. I've said it was so amazing because you I've heard missionaries say this before. Like, it was so important for me to know God's word because there were times when I couldn't have my Bible. But then when you said it, I was like, man, there were, it was so important for her to know God's word because there were times when she couldn't read. There were times when she couldn't, like, hold her Bible. And it was when you drew upon what you had stored in your heart and your brain. 
and God Absolutely. is faithful. Absolutely. I love that you gleaned that insight from the book, Jamie. That's I, I very loved astute it. of you. People brushed over that. But that is so powerful that the fact I was, in fact, not only walking with the Lord, but knew a lot of scripture that was stored deep in my heart that comforted me when I could not write, could not read, could not speak. All of that was taken away. So the sentiment that I had shared to my Bible study pre-stroke was we all need to memorize God's word in case we're locked in prison in a foreign country one day <laughs> with no access to a Bible. Little did I know that right here in Los Angeles, California, I would be stuck in my own prison mm -hmm. of sorts and it would be my own body. Yeah. Yeah. I, I Another thing I love in the book, Catherine, and this is why I think that if we lived in the same town that we would be friends because we both love food. We both oh, love, gosh. I mean, oh, my word. I Absolutely. love good food. It's In your book, you, you couldn't swallow for, the, for a very long time, and you talk a lot about how that was so difficult for you because you just wanted to eat. And I kept reading that going, man, I would have never thought that, but that would be a real struggle for me as well. And one of my favorite stories that you tell is when you um, and Jay were on an airplane and he got up to go to the bathroom. Do you want to tell I, the story? Totally, totally. That was so hilarious. You but tell it. Oh my gosh. So Jay goes to the bathroom. And wait, and stop, stop real quick. You have not eaten anything in how long? Right. So at that point, I had not eaten anything in seven months, I think. Yeah, okay. seven months. So I've been in PO, which means nothing per, per oral for seven months. I had a feeding tube in my stomach. So I was giving nutrients, but nothing, no taste in my mouth. Mm -hmm. So Jay goes to the bathroom, and a uh, um, stewardess walks by and says, Would you like a cookie? Now, <laughs> you can imagine. I have not been asked in seven months if I would like anything to eat. Because everybody knows she can't eat. Exactly. So the stewardess asked, would you like a cookie? So, um, yeah, I would. <laughs> so um, I'm like, absolutely. So I take the cookie, I throw it down, and I think, oh, my goodness, I swallowed it, kind of. And Jay won't even notice when he gets back because, I mean, hello, it all happened while he was in the bathroom. Well, because my face is paralyzed and numb on one side, I have no sensation that the cookie has dripped down my face because I can't really <laughs> swallow it. And there's like a trail hanging out on the right side of my face. Like, You're like a little yeah. kid who snuck a cookie and has it all over their face and their mom is like, Yes, you did eat it. And they're like, no, I didn't. And exactly. It's, it's all exactly. over your face. Totally. So Jay comes out of the bathroom, takes a look at me, and looks horrified, races <laughs> back to the seat, and is like, what happened? What is that? What all that's going on? And I'm like, oh, nothing. What do you mean? <laughs> and he's like, you have like a residue under your mouth. Like, what on earth? And... Anyway, it was quite hilarious, but needless to say, I didn't hide the fact that um, I didn't the cookie too well. My um, situation gives away even my secrets. That's which, hilarious. Maybe that's better. Maybe that's more authentic living anyway. Really, really. Okay, so you couldn't swallow. That was seven months in, and I remember one of your things is you kept taking this test, and the reason that they didn't want you to eat is because if you couldn't swallow, it might go into your lungs. Am I right? Right, exactly. Yeah. Aspirate, mm -hmm. totally. So you tried and tried, and, and, and in the book it was like I could just see you like you, you, you were swallowing doing the test, and you're looking at them like I'm swallowing, right? And they're looking at you like, no, you're not. Like nothing's happening. Um, totally. It, it feels like when you are trying to relearn to swallow, it feels like you are. So imagine what that does to you psychologically. You gear up thinking, oh, well, now I am swallowing for every test. And you fail every one, so you're not. Right. And yet your brain thinks you're going to. It's, it's a horrible letdown every single time you fail one. And uh. I failed 11. And then so how long was it when, when you could finally swallow and eat again? 
Um, not that I'm counting, but <laughs> it was 11 months, five days, and 17 hours. Hilarious. And, um, and 11 minutes, but I know that gets a no, little creepy. No big deal. No big deal. No um, big deal. I you know, see... I just took a break from eating for about a year. Whatever. Right. Whatever. No big deal. Um, Catherine, so you had six months old, six month old when this happened. Um, when was the first time that you held him and did something to where you felt like mom again after your stroke? Well, um, thankfully my family and friends would really try to safely let me engage James. Once we reached a little after the year mark, I really could interact with him a bit, but truthfully, I could not fully be mommy again on um, like physically put him in a crib type thing until he was two and a half. So mm. basically I took about two years off from being his primary caretaker and mm -hmm. you can imagine the pain of that. It was horrible and yet um, it was such beautiful restoration when I could finally care for him and like I previously said it's so cool to know do it for baby John and recognize that um, these these annoying moments of diaper changing or forcing him to nap or whatever are actually really special mm. because um, I didn't have them first time around. Yeah, that's so true. Catherine, I want you to talk to us and the listeners. I mean, there are going to be people that are listening that are going through their own hard times and they may be thinking, well, you know, I haven't had a stroke and I didn't lose, you know, two and a half years of my kid's life where I couldn't hold, pick them up. I mean, they may be thinking it's not this, but this world is hard. And you know that, and you've said that. Oh, people are yeah. going through seriously hard times. And I always say to people, if you're not in a hard time now, it's around the corner. Like it's just, it's the reality of the world that we live in. And I'm so grateful oh, for, totally. for just knowing that God has defeated the world. Um, but what is your encouragement? Like what? You 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 sound so full of hope, and that's a lot of your your theme. And there had there been some severely hard hard days. Oh, absolutely. The reality is that yeah, if you're not in the middle of something, you've just been through something, or you're about to go through something. We're all essentially headed into the thick of something, or just coming out of it. And yeah, this is a broken, messed up world where terrible things happen every day. And even if they aren't rock your world terrible, bad stuff is happening constantly. And that's the truth that makes my story so shockingly um, comparable to what anybody is dealing with on any day. Mine's just on the outside of my body. Because mm -hmm. here's the truth. Yeah. We're all living out what I'm living out on the outside of my body. Meaning we've all got issues, terrible, weird, sad issues on the inside of our body, whether we admit it or not. We've got wounds and scars and we've been through the fire and we've got relational issues and spiritual issues and financial issues and loads of pain and problems. And what's tragic is that the world doesn't see any of these. Mm, uh -huh. And in a way, in a way, I get this beautiful like bypass because I'm showcasing some major legit issues on the outside of my body. Mm. So no one thinks when my 34 year old husband wheels me into the room in my wheelchair that I'm doing just awesome. Everything is great. She's got no problems. No, people are like, gosh. What happened to that couple? Mm -hmm. What's going on with that girl? And I definitely don't want to tell you that I've only got issues on the outside of my body because mm -hmm. I don't. I have loads of issues on the inside of my body. I am one messed up cat. I've got problems. Mm -hmm. And yet, I've got a decent amount on the outside as well. Mm -hmm. So the world gets to see and perhaps that makes the world treat me with more care. And wouldn't we all love that? Wouldn't we all love a t-shirt every day that says, I'm fragile, 
treat me with care. I'm going through a lot here. Mm, mm -hmm. And that's the truth. We all are. We're all in the thick of something. And I've become this microcosm mm. where you may not have a paralyzed face, but I bet you have issues with your appearance and don't feel beautiful all the time. Mm -hmm. And I can't walk, but I bet you don't feel free all the time, even if you can. Or right. I can't parent normally. My hand doesn't even work. Mm -hmm. But who feels like a good parent all the time, even mm -hmm. if they can? Yeah. Nobody. Everybody has issues, even if they're on the inside. I'm just really showcasing them uniquely to the world. And honestly, that's a gift in many ways because I do think it makes people more... I don't know, maybe just gentle, and I sometimes mm. be more gentle with me, mm -hmm. and that, that's kind of cool. Hey guys, before we get back to my conversation with Catherine, I want to talk to you about something that I mentioned to you last week and thank one of our sponsors for the show, um, IJM. Did you know that 45 million, 45 million men, women, girls, and boys are daily being bought, sold, and trafficked and used against their will? Guys, that number is haunting, but I want to let you know there's hope because there's a group of people working day and night, relentlessly searching for each one of these lives. And when they free one life, they search for the next and the next and the next. And that's making them the largest international anti-slavery organization in the world. That's International Justice Mission. If you heard my conversation last week with Melissa Russell, you're more familiar with this than you might have been before. Guys, the problem seems so big, but they're asking us to join them. They're asking us to do something with them, and it's called Freedom Sunday. The idea is simple. On September 25th, your church will dedicate its service to freedom. One Sunday to awaken God's people and answer his call to see slavery in for good. Guys, they, they want this to start with you. The movement to see slavery end in our lifetime starts with you. IJM is asking if you would commit to asking your pastor to host a Freedom Sunday. They're going to give you everything you need from videos to talking points, and someone from IJM will personally walk you through the process. Super easy to commit. Go to IJM.org slash happy hour and click on host a Freedom Sunday. As Gary Halgan says, God has a plan to help bring justice to the world, and his plan is us. All right, here's the rest of my conversation with Catherine. Now, you, you brought up something about, like, your appearance. I know before that um, you were, you know, kind of working part time as a model. And I love that you took your son with you and he was in stuff with you as well. Has there been any struggle now with having a disability and being in a wheelchair? And, you know, you said half your face is. Has that been a struggle for you? Um, I would say, of course, on some level, it's not like I get up in the morning. I'm like, awesome. Face is paralyzed. <laughs> looking good. Wow. But it's really much less of an issue than you might think mm -hmm. because of things like, or early on, I mean, especially because of things like you're relearning to walk and you can't eat food and mm -hmm. you're on life support. That's the least of your worries. Exactly. Yep. In a way, it mm -hmm. was beautiful to have like legit serious issues to deal with. So things like your appearance almost fall away in importance. Like I'm sure the paralyzed face would have been like really significant to me if I could do everything else. But mm. instead, I can't eat food. So I don't really care that I've got a paralyzed face as much because I'm like, I got to relearn to eat here. Like I got the biggies that I'm dealing with. And honestly, I think the takeaway of that lesson is so beautifully perspective on all of our lives. When we're dealing with real deal issues, it can really change how we understand things that are not as big of a deal. Mm. And that's beautiful. And we yeah. should all cultivate that in our own lives. For sure. For sure. Catherine, you talked about two years after your stroke, you started to lead that Bible study I talked about earlier, the Esther Bible study uh, yeah, yeah. that Beth Moore put out. And I, I really love that when you were talking about that, because you felt like, okay, I'm, I'm getting back into doing things that I had done previously. 
um, you know, you're doing this Bible study in your house and you're talking about the, the, the woman in the Bible, Esther and her story. And you talk about a phrase in there that kind of changed a little bit of things for you. And it said in Esther nine, one, it said the reverse occurred. Oh and you, yeah. And absolutely. you felt like that had kind of summed up your story is that what you thought your world would be. It kind of got crushed, but God made something better out of it. Oh, uh, my t- goodness. Jamie, I just love your insights. <laughs> well, you wrote the book. <laughs> uh, yeah. Oh, yeah. But I love that you're asking me about that because isn't that the beautiful truth of the gospel? Mm-hmm. Yeah. I love that. The reverse occurred. Mm. What was meant for tremendous evil is used for incredible good. It's really, it's a beauty. I mean, it's Joseph in the Bible. Hello. Yeah, hello. It's over and over. What ultimately was supposed to be the outcome was the opposite. Mm-hmm. And isn't that amazing? And how beautiful the Esther, because you always hear the phrase like, for such a time as mm-hmm. this. And mm-hmm. I do love that. And for absolutely, sure. for such a time as this. Amen. But the other phrase that's in there that actually is really powerful is the reverse occurred. Mm. Because the reverse occurred basically sums up everything that is my story and everything that is everybody's story, if we have eyes to see it that way. That the opposite of what was supposed to happen, quote unquote, is actually what happens. Mm. Woohoo! Yes. And and you and, and I feel like that there's you know, there's that scripture in um in Romans where it says um, what suffering produces in us, you know, and that's, you, you know, we can rejoice in our suffering because it produces um, character and, and endurance and suffering produces and hope. character, character produces perseverance, no, perseverance produces character, character produces hope, and hope, hope will not be disappoint put to shame. Yeah. because God's love was poured out in our hearts through the power of the Holy Spirit. Mm-hmm. It's so beautiful. I love that truth. So as I'm talking to you and I'm talking, um, and, and you know what? You've you've changed the way I'm thinking about this interview even right now is that I'm coming to you saying, hey, I want to talk to you about suffering and how suffering has um, m- made you see God's hope more and how suffering has, you've seen God more. And you just basically threw this whole interview out of whack when you said, Hey, but really like we're all suffering just because mine looks like it on the outside. So the reality is, is that all of us have something that we're suffering through. You just Absolutely. can't see it. And there's, there's not, there's not like categories of like really bad or not, because here's the thing. When you're going through something, it is really bad. No matter what it is, mm-hmm. it's bad. And if you and your husband have some horrible fight or there's no money in the bank account, or you got a kid acting heinous at school, like these are real bad when it's your life. It's so, so true. I'm not in some unique category. However, with that being said, taking like perspective into your life is so key to mm-hmm. celebrating and going, mm-hmm. you know what? I've kind of got it rough, but somebody else has got it real rough. Mm-hmm. And that's very valuable. So it's always a both and thing, I think. Yeah. So I, I want to ask you another question before we get into what you're loving and what you're reading. Um, what was some of the what when you look back on the past eight years and you see the trials that your family went through, especially those first two years, and even you know even more those first you know that first year after your stroke, what were some of the amazing things that people did for your family? Oh my gosh! I mean, literally, they did everything. Mm-hmm. People brought meals for months. People wrote cards for years. I mean, people really came alongside us in a very unique way. On um, people just provided a deep, deep communal, we are with you thing that was super, super transformative to us. It, um, it, it was intense. I mean, it's something that the world almost can't understand. It's Mm. like this beautiful, um, just, we are with you and Mm. we're not leaving. And we were, our Bible study was doing Dietrich Bonhoeffer's Life Together book before my stroke, funnily enough, Mm -hmm. and really understanding the notion of like life 
together, as the title says, like, let's get in there with each other. Let's, let's be the, a real body that's not just like a surface, weird, fake, hey, how are you? But like, we are not leaving even when it gets rock bottom rough. Mm. We are with you in this, and we feel this as this, as if this is happening to our own family. Oh, and, and that's just what community is and supposed to be. And you just got to experience it. And I think that if we're going to take everything you've been saying, that our community should look like that all the time, even when our suffering isn't a stroke. Absolutely. And I think what's really scary in this digital age is the temptation to really not connect deeply with those around you. And that's such a tragedy. And I think things like phones and internet are awesome in so many ways. I really do. I love them. And yet, how awful to think we are like isolating ourselves from like the deep, dirty, awkward, but so beautiful thing that happens in mm. real authentic community. It's so necessary. It really is. And we talk about that a lot on the happy hour. And so I'm glad you said that. And, and that community is sometimes, I felt like in times that Aaron and I have been in some of our hardest seasons, literally you feel as though that your community is holding your arms up or they are doing the, the things like feeding your children or, you know, taking care of things for you. And that's what community is for. And I love that you got to experience Absolutely. that in a deep way. Oh, totally. Big time, big, big time. I'm a huge fan of the like real unplugged, not picture perfect community that gets in there and does your dirty dishes and changes your baby's diaper because they need to. to exactly. Make it exactly. Oh, that's the best. Um, okay, Catherine, I want to ask you what you're reading these days. Oh, I just finished um, an amazing book called Being Mortal. It's, um, look it up on Google because I don't know how to pronounce the author's name. It's Indian. But it's an incredible book, and it was on the New York Times list a while back, and it's a um, totally secular book. I don't read a ton of totally secular books, but this one was awesome because, oh, this is juicy. Don't miss this. Okay. He, this guy, he's a doctor. <laughs> Excuse me. He's a doctor. And he talks about how America today does not know how to die, essentially. Mm. That what we are doing is developing this deep mortality denying weird mentality that even upon really legit old age and significant health problems, we pretend we're not dying. Mm. We have we have no engagement of death anymore. We send people away to die, like to hospitals, to nursing homes, get them out of sight, out of mind, because we don't understand what 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 death looks like. We mm. want to pretend we aren't dying, so we can't engage it up close. And obviously, the implications are profound to me because what about people who are disabled? who look like they're headed to the grave even now when they are young. Mm -hmm. So I'm fascinated by this mortality denying culture we live in and how that really manifests itself in disabled people. Like we're kind of poster children for one foot in the grave, but actually <laughs> not at all. Right. Like, what does that mean? Mm. Okay. Well, that sounds very interesting. Yeah. It's, um, it's pretty incredible to consider that, like, aging is quite fabulous. It means you're here. Mm -hmm. You still are being, potentially, if you allow yourself to be, used by God. And there's a reason. You're on assignment, and you mm. need to view your life that way, even if you're 85 years old. Yeah. There's... There's a reason you are on this earth right now, and God's calling us at ending in every age to use that for his glory. Well, someone must have told me about this book before because I put it on my Goodreads account to read um, earlier this year. So I don't know where I heard about it, but. Oh, I'm so glad you did. Well, yeah, definitely look at it. Being mortal is amazing. I would highly recommend it. Another book I have to tell you about, which I know you already know about because you interviewed her and I listened to it. It was wonderful. Is Lauren Chandler's book, Steadfast mm -hmm. Love. She is 
awesome. And I love, love, love the notion that the anchor, the anchor, the token of hope, the symbol of hope dramatically impacts everything we do because, and I, I mean, my ministry symbol is an anchor. Hope mm -hmm. heals mm -hmm. all about the anchor. Hebrews 619, this deep notion that hope is the anchor for the soul, firm and secure and not moving. And the beautiful truth of Lauren's brilliant book is that we have access to this anchor and we will not be moved because of it. The hope, the, the symbol of hope provides a true, I don't even know the word, like a, like a true symbol, whatever that is, a deep foundation, I guess mm -hmm. you'd say. That we're not going anywhere. And if you look closely at the anchor, there's a cross within the anchor. And to mm. me, that is no accident. The brilliant anchor of hope is actually, um, uh, from a Christiocentric worldview, like a, a picture of Jesus, the a true anchor mm. of living hope. Yeah. So, um, Check that book out, gang, even though you may already know all about it. And that's way cool. Yes, loved her book and loved Lauren and loved having her on. She was phenomenal as well. Oh, she was so good. Awesome. What's the other thing you asked me okay, about? Okay, what are some three things you're loving? Oh, goodness. Okay, I love kombucha. Do you know kombucha? Okay, it's I'm... I know it and I've tried it, but it, I'm not like a, a fan. I don't, I don't like love it. Okay, here's the thing. You gotta not be trying the right one. Okay. I've gotta tell you, kombucha has become a little bit of an obsession for me. Mm -hmm. I love that like crazy, like funky, sparkling taste because, um, well, one, it's easier to swallow, which means I really love it. But two, it's super good for the gut. And we all need stuff that's good for our um, digestive system, yes. so to speak. Now, kombucha has a ton of probiotics and is super, super good for it has like it's fermented tea. So it's really got a lot of good like stuff to make your gut work best. Anyway, I really love the ginger aid flavor uh -huh. and the gingery lime flavors, which there are multiple brands you can find um, that have both gingery lime and just straight up gingerade flavors. And oh, Cavita, if you know Cavita, it's a fabulous brand for kombucha. And GT's, GT's is awesome as well. Mm. And GT, GT's is actually at Costco right now. And I'm loving getting ginger ale brand of GT's at Costco. Anyway, check it out. Kombucha is awesome in my book. And try ginger lime. Do you I'm make talking, your own? I'm talking way too long about kombucha. No, I'm sorry. You I love just, it. Whenever you love something. I know. Do you make totally. your own or just buy it? Just buy it. To make it is way too much work. It's no a lot. I, I know. Okay. So what else are you loving? I'm loving my capsule that my sweet husband makes me each week. Let me explain. Okay, I need to know. I cannot see very well, and I have problems. Um, even like walking in, what am I talking about? Walking, looking into my tiny closet is such a nightmare. My hand doesn't work, so it's difficult to pull clothes out, blah, blah, blah. So my husband... And I finally come up with a system that I actually recommend for anybody without issues like mine because it makes life so simple. And it's this. Get a capsule in your life. What a capsule is is simply like a small amount of your favorite clothes each week. Right. It's just like put 10 to 12 items out. Um, on a bar in front of your closet and choose between them. It just takes down thinking about clothes mm -hmm. a whole lot. Makes it so simple like, yeah, I'll just grab this shirt with these pants or I'll grab this blouse with this skirt because, hey, it's right in front of my face. So there's no longer trying to figure out what I'm going to wear or what I'm going to choose it's just done easy right in front of you grab it put it on go i love the capsule that is so great and i love that he does that for you oh my gosh jade wolf is like an 11 on the scale of <laughs> yeah. and he is so awesome it's kind of like insane to me 
And, um, yeah, he does create a weekly capsule that um, is pretty awesome. And he actually does all my, like, online shopping for clothes and things because I can't really do all that. Uh-huh. So, And then he dresses me. In I was gonna, did I read somewhere that he does your hair? Well, he did for a very long time have to, but I've learned to use my left hand and uh-huh. dry it and brush it and all that. So he doesn't have to do my hair or makeup anymore. Thankfully, it was really difficult on our marriage. <laughs> <laughs> I can imagine. Oh, my word. It was Well, imagine that your husband's in your face right after some rock and fight trying to put your lipstick on. Can you imagine? <laughs> like, complicated. Very much, very much. Okay, so you love your kombucha and your capsule wardrobe. What else? My neighborhood. Oh, my gosh. I live in Culver City, California, which is in the heart of Los Angeles. Uh-huh. And it's just this crazy little Mayberry in the land of, like, like, what do you even call that? Concrete? Yeah, paradise. concrete jungle, yeah. Jung- concrete jungle, not paradise. <laughs> level, like jungle. Um, my son walks to school in the morning. We have a coffee shop on the end of our street. There are endless restaurants a few blocks away. Um, my, my physical therapy spot's a couple more blocks over. I mean, our lives are so contained in this tiny space that we don't drive anywhere. I'm not mm. kidding, except to church. We get in the car very, very rarely. And that is so key since I can't drive. Right. So I just feel like the Lord gave me this precious gift and not going anywhere by car because I'd be riding. And it would be super sad to feel like I could not take my son to school. And instead, I use my wheelchair and it goes just fine. It's awesome. That is so wonderful. It's like God just, I mean, because he's God and he does actually ordain things in our life, but he just put all these things in your world that he knew were going to be of such a value and importance to you, you know, eight years later. Oh my gosh, absolutely. God is always doing way more than we could ask, think, or imagine. And his plans, as we know, are way better than ours. So of course he did this, you know, For sure. even though I probably... I, I probably have low expectations of God way back in my mind. Like, well, he's probably not going to do that for me. I've got a weird scarcity mentality, I'm Mm. sure, in some ways that creeps in and thinks, well, I'm unworthy of having this thing, or I'm not going to get this, or I'm not going to be this, or whatever. But the truth is, God's plans are always far better than anything we could even imagine. Mm. And he's working out tremendously beautiful things for our good constantly. What we need to do is actually expect more of God and less of this world. Mm. We need to take down the expectations that we so ridiculously place on other people and translate that those emotions to our father who can do absolutely everything. Mm. We need to redefine what it means to engage expectation. Mm. Girl, you just preach. I'm just going to sit back here and listen and you're just going to go for it. Right. I mean, Uh, that's kind of my deal. I can't help (laughs) myself. God, God has done too much in my story to not give him all the props for Mm -hmm. what he's doing. I mean, it's nothing I'm doing. And please, if I'm distractingly loud and spastic and awkward, like, I really hope that never supersedes the greatness of God Mm -hmm. in my story. Mm -hmm. I I long to not be a distraction. I long to be a vessel of him. But I come in a loud, dramatic, spastic package. And I never want that to take away from what God has done here because mm. it's so cool and I really love to champion my story and just wear it well I am severely disabled and I want to wear this unique opportunity so well that points to Jesus and never distracts people because it's one messed up little package 
Yeah, well, you know what, Catherine, I think that you're doing just that. From what your desire is, is to, to be a vessel. And I can see that um, in your writing, in your book, Hope Heals. And I see that in our conversation today. And I see that when I interviewed you earlier this year and got to meet you then, is that you really are embracing, and I love how you call it, this unique gifting that God has given you of suffering at a young age um, to point everything back to him. And and, and it sounds cliche to say what a gift he's given you that he just knows that, that he's trusted you with this to point people, point you back to him. Um, but I think that your story is going to encourage so many people listening today um, that might be in the middle of suffering or it might be around the corner or they might have just gotten out of it is for them to embrace it and say, like, I'm going to wear this well and I'm going to point to Jesus. So thank you, thank you, thank you. Oh, thank you, Jamie. I echo all of that times a thousand to you because how beautiful for you to really celebrate people doing work for the kingdom. That's really amazing and speaks to the kind of woman you are to instead of trying to compete or doing some weird like girly drama dumb thing. Instead, you're celebrating what other women are passionate about. And I love that. Let's all do that with our lives, please. Yes. I'm not into the girly drama dumb thing like you said. I like that. that was yeah, the I'm best. not either. <laughs> I'm really not either. I'm from a family of um, three girls with um, a lot of wonderful drama. Like yes, I bet. Out. I bet. Uh, well, Catherine, thank you. And I'm going to put in the show notes where everyone can find you and follow you. And you're basically everything is uh, Hope Heals. And that's your book. And you just, you and Jay are, have a great ministry going on. And I just thank you for all that you guys are doing for the kingdom as well. Oh, and, thank you, Jamie. And excited to watch you parent those boys. Oh, well, thanks. It's awesome. I'm, I'm blessed. I'm crazy, crazy blessed. Awesome. Well, thank you for coming on the happy hour. Okay, guys, I told you you would love her. Don't you wish you could just sit in front of her and listen because she is so passionate and so animated. I thoroughly enjoyed meeting her in February and being in the same room with her as we had our interview. And I wish I could have just sat in front of her during this interview. But I love her so much. And I hope that you'll head on over to Amazon right now to purchase the book that she wrote with her husband, Jay. I'll put a link in the show notes if you don't have any time to write anything down. Okay, guys, I told you I was going to tell you about the events happening. This past March, we hosted our very first Happy Hour Live event at my home in Austin, Texas, and it was so beautiful. It was so wonderful. About 125 of you joined us from all over the country, and we literally laughed, and we cried, and we ate amazing food that Aaron made, and we met new friends, and it was just a really awesome and special night. And guys, we're doing it all again. I've been telling you guys now that if you want to know when events are happening with the Happy Hour, you need to be subscribed to my newsletter. Now, there's been a little bit of confusion, so I'm going to clear the air right now. This is a bit different than what you subscribe to on my blog, where all the posts are delivered to your inbox. That's fine if you do that, but the newsletter is a bit more than blog posts. It's just information. And so to make sure that you never miss another announcement, head on over to jamieavy.com newsletter and get on the list. As far as events go, guys, we have three events coming up, and there are still a few tickets left. First up is our Happy Hour on the Road in Fort Worth, Texas on August 15th. This is our second Happy Hour on the Road event. We did one a couple weeks ago in Bryan College Station, and it was so much fun. We, ha we hosted at the Haven. Unfortunately, guys, all the tickets are sold out for this one, but we cannot wait to drive up I-35 from Austin to meet all you Dallas-Fort Worth ladies. Next up is our Happy Hour Live event, just like we did in March at my house in my backyard with Aaron Cooking. We're going to have special guests that I haven't announced to you yet, but I cannot wait until you find out who's coming in. These nights are so much fun. Now, the Saturday night event sold out in about an hour. It was craziness. And so then we had this crazy idea that we'll just do another live event the night before. So it's going to be, a, it's going to be pretty much the same, but with different guests. And I'll let you know who that is later. There are still a few tickets left for the Friday night event. And you never know if we might open up more tickets for Saturday night. It depends on how crazy I feel. You never know. So guys, go to jamieivy.com and look for the button on the right that says events. It's easy to find the tickets there. And I seriously would love to see you at one of my events because my main goal at every event is to give every person a hug. So come on if you can. Guys, if you want us to come to your city for a happy hour on the road, email info at jamieivy.com. Oh my gosh, this is the episode with the most information ever. I have one more thing to tell you. Oh my gosh, I'm so sorry. Thank you for listening if you're still here. Last but not least, we are always looking for more people to partner with for the show. 
there are several opportunities to partner together from advertising on the show to putting your product in goodie bags at live events. We had some amazing goodie bags last time to talking about your products on the show. If you're interested in partnering with the happy hour for live events or our regular everyday shows or getting your product in front of these awesome ladies that come out to our shows, send an email to info at jamieivy.com and we'll be sure and get you hooked up there. All right, guys. Woo. I gave you a lot of information today. We had an amazing guest and I just want to remind you every single thing I talked about today, you can find on my website, jamieivy.com. Okay, jamieivy.com. I'd love to hear from you. Today's show was edited by Knox McCoy from the podcast, and the music is from Jason Poe. Guys, next week, my guest is Kate Braun, and we had a very honest conversation about dwarfism. I was blown away by something that she told me that actually happens to her on a weekly basis. I literally could get angry about it, thinking about it again. So I want you to listen. Tell me if you're not blown away as well. Don't forget about the happy hour, half hour, every other Friday where I invite a guest that's already joined me to come back. And we do a bit of a rapid fire questions. And here's the best part. This show's only 30 minutes long. This one's going to be like an hour and a half with all the talking I've done to you guys. Uh, Just kidding. But the perfect pick me up for your commute home from work on a Friday or the two-year-old's nap time or dishes or 30 minutes on a treadmill or whatever you might be doing for 30 minutes, bring me with you. Guys, enjoy your week. Share this show with a girlfriend and have a happy hour with a friend. (music) 